When I hear little kids hooping and hollering after songs like that, that's what Jesus means when he says, it is to these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. Oh, that we could be like them more often. Thank you, choir. Uh, let's pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so that hearing, we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are not told whether or not the questioners from Jerusalem that we discussed last week left their conversation with John the Baptist satisfied. In fact, we're not even told that they left. The next day just begins, and they're just gone. It's as though John the Evangelist, and by that I mean the author of the Gospel of John, doesn't care to mention how that exchange ended, because it doesn't matter. What matters is this new day. On this day, the future and the present converge. Today, the one who is coming becomes the one who has come. For the first time in the narrative, Jesus is here, the Word made flesh. If you have your Bibles and would like to keep up, we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. It, of course, is available to you on your screen as well. This is verses 29 through 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend on him like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God, the Word of the Lord. So John sees Jesus coming, and as he approaches, John says of him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. With these words, John is calling our attention to the fulfillment of his own prophecy. In a kind of biblical, I told you so, he says, This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. See, Jesus has been in the background more or less this whole time, but now he has moved to the foreground. It is about him now. It always was, really. But how did John know that this is who Jesus was? And what is the Lamb of God. What does that mean? Do you ever struggle to just put your finger on just who Jesus is? Don't get me wrong. We know the Sunday school answers. I do. You certainly do. One of which is in this passage. The Son of God. A man who died for us. Perhaps a teacher. With a capital T, of course not a lowercase, and so on. But even these answers, instilled as they are in so many of our minds, are shrouded by uncertainty. We can so often be like little children who are beginning to expand our vocabularies. We remember the titles and the words. We know how to say them, perhaps even how to spell them but we're not quite sure what they mean. So we need a witness. We need a reliable testimony concerning the identity of Jesus. 
And John is that witness. See, John is actually a, compares- a companion Excuse me, in our uncertainty. He says, I myself did not know him, meaning that once upon a time, he couldn't quite put his finger on it either. But that's an odd thing for him to say, right? John and Jesus were cousins, after all. Their mothers, Elizabeth and the Virgin Mary, respectively, were relatives, pregnancy buddies, as it were, pregnant at the same time. And as the saying goes, cousins are the best friends you never ask for. You can't escape them. In fact, sometimes you end up knowing them a little too well. But in the Gospel of John, there is a recurring theme of people knowing who Jesus is, but not knowing who Jesus is. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Oh, yes. They knew he was Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus bar Joseph, son of Joseph, but they did not know who this Jesus was. And this was not just true of Jesus' opponents. Later in John's gospel, Philip, one of the disciples, asks Jesus to show him the Father, to show me who God is. And Jesus responds, Have I been with you so long? And yet you still do not know me, Philip? John, too, had been with Jesus a long time. And yet he, like Philip, like the world, and like you, and like me on occasion, didn't know who he was. But all that changed for John. And he tells us how. He takes us back to the day when he saw Jesus for all that he was. You see, he had been told by the one who sent him to baptize with water, namely God, that he on whom you see the Spirit descend is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Descend and remain, excuse me. God's promise here is filled with biblical echoes that we can't exhaust, but are worth unpacking a little bit. In Isaiah 11, the prophet looked ahead to the coming of, as he puts it, a shoot from the stump of Jesse, meaning someone from the line of King David, on whom the Spirit of the Lord would rest, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, This anointed one would be a good king. He would rule with integrity and faithfulness, filling the earth with the knowledge of the Lord, the prophet says, as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 61 says that this king would bring good news to the poor, that he would heal the brokenhearted, that he would proclaim liberty to the captives and open the prison doors of those who were bound. His coming would mean the arrival of the year of the Lord's favor. And as a sign of this new year, as a sign of what time it was, he would baptize, not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. Now I know that baptism of and with the Holy Spirit is a bit of a controversial phrase in some circles. But I think theologian Karl Barth is right when he describes the baptism of the Spirit as the Spirit's action to free a person, quote, to run to the God whom he previously sought to evade, to be faithful to the God of whom he was previously unfaithful, end quote. In other words, the Spirit, which once was present in the creation of all that is, will create new people. And this renewal would be worked through the anointed one. He would renew God's people. He will renew you and me. He will renew the world 
Because the arrival of the Holy Spirit means the beginning of God's new creation. He on whom you see the Spirit rest and remain, God says to John. That's him. That's him. And what does John say that he saw? I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on Jesus. John looked upon cousin Jesus. He observed a dove descend upon him, and for the first time he saw. That word for saw or to see in Greek is a wonderful Greek word, theaomai. It's what it is. It denotes seeing not only with the physical eye, but with, as Edward Clink puts it in his commentary of John, a sense of perception that is above and beyond what can be seen with merely the eye, end quote. John sees with what author and preacher Frederick Beekner calls the eyes of the heart, a kind of sight that goes beyond the physical and the factual. My eyes, my physical eyes, see Phoebe Joe as a baby, a six-week-old as of yesterday. But the eyes of my heart see her as my daughter. My pride and joy, a person so precious to Sarah and me that either of us without a second's hesitation would give our lives to save her if we ever had to. <laughs> John's eyes saw his cousin, but the eyes of the heart witnessed what can only be called the fellowship of the Holy Trinity, of the Father anointing the Son with the Holy Spirit. And for the first time in his life, John recognized Jesus for who he was. I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Jesus is the Spirit-anointed one. He is God's Son, so inextricably tied to his Father that later on in the Gospel, he will have the audacity to say, I and the Father are one. He is the one who renews us, giving you and me the right to become children of God should we believe in his name. Do you see him now? John's witness to Jesus as God's son and all that that title entails raises a question for us, or it should for careful readers, and that is how. How will Jesus take away the sin of the world? How will he cleanse our hearts and souls with the refining fire of the Spirit? How will new creation begin? And it is here that John the Evangelist, not so much the Baptist, uses the words of the Baptist to introduce a little bit of foreshadowing. John announces Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lambs were, of course, a sacrificial animal offered by the people of God to God for the forgiveness of sins. Lambs also evoked memories of Passover, of the decisive act in which God freed his people from oppression and slavery in Egypt and judged the enslaving forces that subjected them to it in the first place. What could this mean? Well, it will take the entire gospel of John to find out. But when, in the end, Jesus is crucified on, of all days, the day of preparation of the Passover, that is, the day the Passover lamb was slaughtered, it all starts to become just a little more clear. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus, the Son of God, is also the Passover Lamb of God, the once and sufficient sacrifice in which he takes away the sin of the world by taking on the sin of the world, yours and mine with it. Do you see him now? Did you notice that John doesn't have an audience in this passage? The committee from Jerusalem is gone, and we're not told that there's a crowd around him. And the gospel is usually mentioned that. So who's he talking to? I mean, sure, we, we could assume that he was going about his business of baptizing, and that might even be a good assumption. But it is still just that, an assumption. So who's he talking to? He's talking to you. That he has no audience means that the world is his audience. His witness to Jesus cannot be contained to a specific point in time. It extends beyond the confines of the first century, beyond the confines even of the page, into the hearts and ears of the likes of us living in Catawba County, North Carolina. And that is because John's witness is still true. The Spirit remains on Jesus. He remains the Son of God, united with the Father. He lives and breathes to this very day. And to this very day, the witness of John still serves to direct our attention to him. This is, as he said, the purpose for which he baptizes. And it is indeed the purpose in which we continue to baptize. So how do I apply John's witness to my life then? That's the question we Baptists are always asking about the text, right? What is the main idea? And how can I apply it? How many passages of Scripture have we butchered with this method of reading? How many times have we completely missed the point because we were looking for the point? But this passage throws a wrench into that machinery because John's witness cannot be packaged into some trite application. His testimony cannot be condensed into some oversimplified moral truth because John is drawing our attention to Jesus, the Christ. And the person of Jesus cannot be applied to our lives any more than the sun can be applied to your lives. In it, you live and move and have your being, whether you acknowledge it or not. There's no application to be had. Jesus cannot be summed up that way. Once he's been revealed, which John has done, he may only be responded to, not applied never applied. The Word of God demands a response from those who encounter Him. And by the way, no response at all is a response. There are no neutral reactions to God's Word. So how are we to respond to Jesus? One word, one word only. Behold. Behold Him, John says. Behold the Lamb of God. Gaze upon the person of Jesus Christ in fear and wonder and see him for who he is. Beholding entails more than just looking or observing. Jotting down a few facts. To behold something or someone is to recognize its glory. To be overwhelmed by its magnitude and majesty. When you're having lunch with a friend, you're just looking at him. 
in the simplest sense, observing his mannerisms, making eye contact in the interest of a healthy conversation. But when, on your wedding day, the door is opened up, your soon-to-be wife emerges, draped in white, white, headed towards you of all the lucky people, and your first response is silence, tears, and the strangest combination of joy and terror that you have ever felt in your life. You aren't just looking, you are beholding. John reveals Jesus to us. He is a reliable witness to the identity of Christ. And seeing Jesus for who he is, our first and eternal response can only be to behold him, to be awestruck by his glory, to be overwhelmed by his goodness, to see in the person of Jesus Christ a person who seems so far beyond us and yet who became one of us and dwelt among us that he might die for us that he might die for you. To recognize the one by whom and for whom we were made. And to see and bear witness that this is the Son of God. Have you beheld him? Have you fallen prostrate in worship before the presence of the Lamb of God because if you haven't, or if it's been a while since you have, no other application will matter. It won't matter what moral truth you took away from the message, whatever that means. It won't matter what you got out of it. Such things are secondary responses to Jesus, not primary. And a Jesus that is taken for granted in the name of practical application, is a Jesus not seen and certainly not appreciated. What matters is that we behold Jesus, the Lamb of God, and respond to his glory in surrender, adoration, and worship. For in so doing, we are participating in eternity. Then I looked and heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. <laughs> 